Constructing a character-rich narrative around a time-traveling plotline can become somewhat confusing and muddled, and Steins Gate succeeds at doing so. From the MCU-level visual novel multiverse named Science Adventure to the historical and fictional theories on time, relativity, and the universe, there is a lot to dissect here. But at the center of it all is an emotional journey spanning three major timelines that deserves to be explained and understood fully to truly appreciate the tale of a man desperate to save the two people that give his life purpose. This is more than just a time traveler's journey. This is making sense of Steins Gate. Before anything else, there are two things I need to explain. First is CERN, a research organization that sits as one, if not the most ambiguous entities of Steins Gate that receives no explanation throughout the series. But what if I told you it didn't need one? For there's a real equivalent that tells us everything we need to know. CERN is a fictional interpretation of CERN, an international nuclear research institute in Geneva that's main function is the study of particles, the universe, and how it functions. Creators of the LHC, a large hadron collider, that allows the view of usually unseen particles to become viewable and studied. This organization over the years has found itself at the center of many conspiracy theories, ranging from trying to create black holes to being actual Satanists. While the first one may or may not have some accuracy, I think it's safe to say the second one is far more far-fetched. While this information on the organization may seem a little unimportant to you now, later it makes much more sense. Now the real world CERN isn't the world domination research organization that we come to know, but Stein's CERN is very much so, researching time travel and performing human experimentation by the time the story starts. But we'll get to all that in due time. There's one other thing that needs to be explained beforehand. Science Adventure, a loosely connected visual novel anime universe in which three main story take place, Chaos Head, Stein's Gate, and Robotic Notes taking place in that order. While it's not necessary to watch all three to understand one of them, it's worth mentioning that the scientific theories and principles employed in this world build off each other, Kurisu using Nimi's time travel notes to explain their time machine's operating principles. There are other subtle nods to the story proceeding, which is Chaos Head, but nothing major that makes it a necessary watch. It's worth noting that these three series were all visual novels to begin with, Stein's Gate having six endings, which meant only one would get adapted, that being the true ending, one where all are saved from the dark fates that await them, an ending that wraps up everything in a nice neat bow, or at least that's what I'd like to say. Things aren't ever that simple, according to Stein's Gate. Somewhere along the way, the mad scientist Okabe, or as he would like to be called Kyoma, lost sight of his childhood friend, leading him to accidentally stumbling upon a renowned young scientist, murdered, laying in a pool of her own blood the killer nowhere to be found. Okabe flees the building in fear, trying to call Daru to inform him the scientist Kurisu has been killed. But just as he hits send, the world around him shifts. It distorts. He finds himself back in front of the building of the stabbing despite having just ran down the street. But that's not the only oddity. Okabe was originally at the building to sit in on a presentation on time travel. Only now, the presentation never happened, and a massive satellite has taken residence on the top floor of the building. Not just that, but it seems that Kurisu as well was never stabbed. Okabe's message about this event that now has not taken place, still reaching Daru, but somehow sent one week into the past. The only person that seems to have experienced this alternate time is Okabe himself. No one but him remembers the seemingly fictional events that just took place on screen. Daru and Mayuri brush off Okabe's retelling of the events, chalking it up as his long-standing Chunibyo syndrome, in which he talks to himself on the phone about a secret organization that controls the world from behind the scenes, and about how they are out to get him he uses the Elias Kyoma instead of his real name. But it seems this time Okabe is not just mentally ill. Time is shifting in a way I can only explain on a whiteboard. So this is a world line. Next to it is another world line. Two separate universes. On this one, Kurisu is stabbed. And following the events of Okabe receiving the D-mail, he jumps from here over to here on a new world line. In this world line, Kurisu is never stabbed. He doesn't get murdered. Now the difference between these two lines is a numeral value of 1%. There is a 1% space in between this line and that line that separates it and makes it differently. Now somehow, these both these lines have their own gravitational pull. Now the reason because of this, it's purely theoretical. Apparently, there are thousands of lines, different world lines that make up these major segment, each consisting of hundreds, if not thousands, of different world lines. While there may be slight changes in between worlds, like maybe Okabe on that line goes and gets a sandwich, 
and on this line he goes and gets Udon. The only important part is that major events happen, i.e. Kudisu is stabbed or she is not stabbed. This completely changes how the world works and it's why it's separated by 1%. So for instance, if Kurisu is stabbed on World Light and Beta, on Alpha, she remains alive. And this is a major change in events that drastically shifts how history continues. Therefore, they're separated by the divergence meter because they're so different. Keep in mind this entire theory is operating on the idea that time is relative. The past, the present, the future, the eternity, it's all simultaneous. Which you may know, this idea is backed by Einstein's theory of relativity, as well as built upon the block universe theory. While the theory of relativity allows Okabe to travel, let's say on the world line here, to the past, present, future, whatever, perfectly fine, given that everything is happening at once, the block universe theory allows him to travel to a different universe based on the fact that all of these universes are happening at once, all simultaneously. The idea is that Einstein's relativity theory allows you to travel to the past, present, and future on the current world line you are on. But if you add the block universe theory into the mix, you can also do this on different world lines since they're all happening at once. We'll come back to this idea later, but for now, that's all you need to know. Okabe has noticed slight and major changes of the world line alpha. Not only is Kurisu alive, but the internet forum time traveler, known as John Titer here but is based on a real person, has just appeared in 2010. In world line beta, Titer appeared in 2000 to do some family business, then go back to 1975 to attain an IBM 5100, known as IBM 5100 in the real world. This alter in reality, while relatively small, disorients Okabe. His books on John Titer no longer exist as if the Titer of 2000 was was erased from existence. Titer contacts Okabe upon hearing this to inform him he may have saw another version of Titer on a different world line. Okabe has traveled from one major world line, world line beta, to another, world line alpha. Normally, no one fully remembers if they've shifted world lines, but for some reason Okabe has this ability which he later coins his reading Steiner. As his curiosity and borderline insanity sparks, Okabe also has a breakthrough on his phone microwave gadget, which turns out to be a shrewd time machine capable of traveling a banana into the past. The only downside is it turns to green jelly. Still though, it's a time machine, and it freaks Kurisu out, who has just became Okabe's new lab member. This discovery leads Okabe to learn that when his message of Kurisu's death was sent, Dadu was operating the microwave, sparking it to send a message back in time therefore shifting the world line to one where Okabe has discovered time travel through the phone microwave. Okabe is told by Titer that CERN has been experimenting on time similar to what he has described about the microwave, although CERN has progressed slightly further. The lab decides it's best if they obtain more information on CERN by hacking into their network to learn how far they've actually come. Dadu is successful in gaining access but can't crack it anymore without a specific computer from the 70s that has the code cracking capabilities that no other computer to this date has. This is none other than the IBM 5100. As for the moment though, Dadu can only access a CERN email box, which leads them to find out that someone has died during CERN's experiments. Seeing this, they feel it's necessary to dig further into it, so they look for the computer. But what's more interesting to me is the confirmation in the email that sets up how exactly Okabe's message was able to travel through time. So CERN's email confirms that they've been experimenting with creating mini black holes, which is a real life superstition, which some of you may know. But back to this CERN, what's true about them is they've actually done this experiment. It's been proven through the email that they have created black holes within their LHC. The LHC is a particle accelerator which heats up electrons within this area showing us things that normally go unseen in our universe. There is this idea though that heating up these particles could result in creating many black holes within the particle accelerator. Now this isn't the goal of real life CERN, but for Steins Gate CERN, this is very much a fact. Now CERN's goal with this is to use these mini black holes to find a way to time travel. And this is based on the theory of Kerr black holes. Now as you may know, black holes are a source of extreme gravitational pull and that's why they're black. No light can escape from this void here. Now black holes have three variables to them. One of them is mass, one of them is momentum, angular momentum, and the other is electrical charge. Depending on these three variables, there are four black hole types. And since this isn't a TED talk about black hole theory, we're just going to talk about the one used in the show, Kerr black holes. Now Kerr black holes are not electrically charged. They simply have angular momentum, and mass. Every black hole has mass. What this means then, in theory, is that 
Because it has momentum but not an electrical charge, curved black holes can suck things into them, partly due to the momentum and partly due to stuff that we will not go into detail about. The idea is that if you entered a human into the curved black hole or anything, any object, it will be transported to the other side of the black hole, seemingly jumping through space-time, through the universe, and ending at a separate point. If this is your present here, and you go through the black hole, you're going to end up at a different time. Who knows what it would be? But if we were able to harness this power, if we were able to control where from the present we go to outside of the black hole, that's a different story. Being able to harness that theory, if that was possible, we would basically create time travel. You know, Kabe and Dadu do this by accident. Somehow, through the combination of the microwaves and phone waves, we somehow have a way to produce mini Kerr black holes. A CRTV underneath the microwave producing electrons to heat up the particles. This heats up the Kerr black holes enough to become naked singularities, meaning that they'll consume information as these are spinning due to the electrons being donated, and then eventually will be transported to a different point in space-time. Now, how far these messages are sent are based upon the microwave clock somehow. They then put it a time, and this will tell them how long these black holes will spin, meaning how long or how far they will travel back into the past in this case. At some point along the way, Kurisu does some experimenting to figure out what exactly is the formula to figure out how far they're sending things into the past. If we find out what we put on the microwave and what the variation between the things are, then we can figure out how far it'll travel into the universe. Now, I'm not a scientist. I study philosophy in Japanese. I don't know if that's correct. It's something like that. Anyway, the idea is that the D-mail, which is sent on the phone, goes back through the black hole into the past to wherever it was supposed to go. Now there is a limitation to this, and it's the fact that these black holes are only so big, meaning that they are limited by 36 bytes as they figure out of data to send back into the past. This is why, as you saw, when they heated up the banana and sent it to the past, it eventually turns into green jelly upon returning. This means that human physical time travel is currently impossible. Since humans are made up of even more data or bytes, if the banana is not working, then the humans can't. The idea is that because the black hole is so small, cramming something through is going to compress it way too much. And CERN itself has experimented with sending humans back, and they run into the exact same problem. They get green, mushy humans in the past, and they also don't know how to control where exactly they are sending human. So basically, in a nutshell, that is Steins Gates time travel. You funnel data through a black hole, it comes out the other side based on the time on the microwave using an equation they made up currently limited by 36 bytes of data, that changes later on, and poof, the data pops out on the other side, delivered to the phone or message number that you chose. So in comparison to CERN's time travel, they are currently using humans to try to send back in time. They use their LHC to create many black holes, which they're using to transport these people through time. The issue is, they are limited by data as well. While it's a very much higher number, they still can't compress the human body. That's the issue. So when the humans come out the other side in the past, one issue they run into is they have no locational control. They can't decide where they're gonna send them back. So there's been humans appearing green, which is the issue of the data, but also within like a brick wall. They would have been dead even if they weren't green. So currently CERN has an issue which Okabe has solved, which is locational. And they also have the issue of too, not enough data. And the lab members are about to find all of this out. With the use of an IBM 5100, Okabe was able to find at a nearby shrine. Dadu hacks into CERN, revealing that they have been performing human experimentation with time travel, causing various green jelly-like humans to appear across the world over the past 100 years due to failed attempts. Okabe becomes terrified by this finding, afraid they've gone too far, and that he's put his friends, especially Mayuri, in danger. Despite the mad scientist persona he acts as on the surface, he's a very gentle and emotional guy. The last thing he wants is someone like Mayuri who is uninvolved in his schemes to get hurt because he was reckless. But somehow that doesn't stop him from telling anybody with ears about his time travel advancements.
Yeah, I'm my own sponsor. The Sock Sensei merch is out now, and before you skip forward, I will be giving away free shirts, so stick around to find out how to enter the raffle. But before that, let me tell you about some of these hand-drawn designs that I painstakingly created myself. For my first design, I drew up a cool TV head robot projecting the Sensei logo from his face. You can choose between two designs. One reads Saku wa Kakoi on the back. The other is Saku Sensei o Mite on the front of the clothing. But that's not all I have to offer on the Twin Soul store. My good friend and I I put together some more designs as well, some that are inspired by the store itself, another inspired by the show we host with our lovely assistant over on Normal Ones. Mr. Reynolds, if you want a free shirt, just let me know. Logan even has his own channel designs on the store as well, so there's a lot to check out. Go ahead and take a look for yourself. We appreciate buyers as well as window shoppers. Now for the giveaway. I will be choosing three random Shujin Patreon tier members on April 13th to send a free t-shirt of your choice, so if you want to be enrolled in the contest, all you have to do is be a tier 3 member by April 13th. I really hope you guys like the designs. All the revenue we make from the store will be going directly into making the videos you love to watch better. The lab team experiments with sending D-mail into the past to find out if it will alter the current world line. In the first test, Okabe sends a winning lottery number to his past self. Well, they don't win because Uruka, the shrine maiden, who is actually a male by the way, mistakenly put one wrong number in. Regardless though, it still proves that the machine works. The second D-mail though alters the world line in a way that goes under Okabe's radar. A girl Okabe met and proceeded to babble to about his time machine wants to send a message to herself to stop her from changing her phone, which Okabe allows. What he does doesn't know is she sends a message telling herself where the IBM 5100 is at instead, allowing her to take it before Okabe can, meaning the lab members lose their ability to navigate around the certain system they hacked into. Surprisingly enough, the reason she wants to obtain this is for an organization she works for named Rounder, the person she is serving codenamed FB, something that isn't important now but will be later. The only apparent effects at the moment of her D-mail is the disappearance of the IBN, something Okabe overlooks. The third D-mail alters the gender of Luke. The guy has always wanted to be a girl and sends a message to his mother to eat more vegetables, a superstition that doing so will cause you to have a girl, meet if you want a boy. It's strange. This D-mail ends up being successful when Luka becomes a girl. The fourth D-mail, sent by Mayuri and Okabe's friend Akia, alters Akirabara, causing it to remain an electronic depot and never be introduced to the Moe anime culture that to this day populates the area. The message she sent saved her father from a car crash by causing him to stay home. Originally, his death caused Akia to introduce Moe culture to the city. Now the fifth D-mail sent alters the timeline yet again. The part-time warrior Suzua, that talks about being a soldier like she just got shipped back from Afghanistan, tells Okabe that she plans to find her father today, and if she doesn't, she will be leaving Tokyo. What he doesn't find out till later is that this meant going back to 1975 in her time machine. This girl is actually John Titer and is in search of an IBN to give to Okabe by giving it to Akia's father, who then gives it to the shrine Okabe eventually finds it at. When Okabe stops her from leaving by sending himself a D-mail to pursue her no matter what, his consequences are immense, further solidifying their world line in the major alpha line. So far, every D-mail has acted as a domino effect, leaving him stuck here, which isn't a bad thing right now. Kurisu is alive and well in this line, and everyone seems happy. Nothing could go wrong, right? Chaos theory underlines that within seemingly inconclusive randomness of chaotic systems, i.e. the universe and our lives, there are patterns, interconnections, and feedback loops. When applied to time travel, there are some events fated to happen, inevitable, and Okabe is about to experience one of such that exists in Worldline Alpha. Kurisu sets out to create a time machine that can send your current memories into the past by compressing and pulling information from your brain and sending it in a much similar way to D-mail by relying on the use of CERN's LHC to send the information since they'd be able to send more bytes of data than the 36 bytes they were originally limited to due to the smaller size of curved black holes that were created by the phone microwave. When finished though, the lab members are unsure if they should go through with this experiment. It's incredibly risky, morally and ethically questionable, and there is a fear that whoever uses it may die. They eventually decide that it's best they don't after Mayuri pleads with Okabe to not risk it. They decide to go public with their current invention and hand it over to a larger research team who will know how to properly deal with this predicament. The issue is, CERN doesn't want that. This entire time, without their realization, CERN has been keeping tabs, logging their advancements since the very first email that Okabe accidentally sent that day of Kurisu's stabbing, the original event that caused the transition to Worldline Alpha. And today, a mercenary group known 
known as Rounder, has been dispatched to silence them, but not kill them. As for CERN to one day conquer the world, they must leave Okabe, Daru, and Kurisu alive. But there is one of them that isn't needed. <laughs> All they need is for Okabe and Daru to eventually make the time travel advancements and form a resistance against them in order to maintain World Line Alpha, the world line they rule in, and the need for Krisu to eventually work for them. Mayuri is just extra baggage, the one that delivers the bullets none other than Moeka, a CERN hired spy. Suzu ambushes the rounder mercs and tells Okabe to use the time travel to transport his mind into the past. Krisu and him start the machine and send him back, his reading Steiner allowing him to remember the preceding events and hopefully change them. But at the moment, he's at a loss. He tries to get Mayuri away from the lab to save her, but she's still killed. He tries to lead her out of town, she still dies. A new method still leads to death. Another try still leads to the inevitable. No matter how many times he travels back and tries to prevent her death, he's met with the same reality. His childhood friend always dies. No matter if by the rounders or by freak accident, he cannot save her. But he can't just give up either. He's left living the same day, hopeless to stop her death until he finally turns to others for help. Originally too mentally shaken and laser focused on saving Mayuri, he does not explain what is happening to anyone, solo opting it. But after Kurisu tries to comfort him, he tells her everything and the two begin planning a way to save Mayuri. But Kurisu makes it clear to him that he needs to be careful. There's no telling what these time leaps will do to him over time. Since humans are largely temporal creatures, altering our perception of time so much could crack Okabe's identity. Basically, he could go insane if he hasn't already. The issue is, however, no matter what they try, it seems that Mayuri is bound by fate itself to die today. But Suzuha offers a solution. She walks in on the two planning and decides it's time to tell Okabe why he can't save Mayuri and the constraints that lie on Worldline Alpha. He hands him a divergence meter, a literal representation of what world line they are on, based on a percentage system, 0 to 0.99%, representing the major alpha world line. She tells him to save Mayuri, he must cross the 1% barrier to enter the major beta world line, where she does not die. But to do so, she must alter the events of time dramatically. In this case, he must revert the existence of the first email that led CERN to track Okabe and further their time travel research. To do this though, he must obtain an IBM 50 100 to re-enter the CERN system and delete the information they have on them. The issue is because of the d-mail sent earlier, the IBM is more lost than I am trying to comprehend, a believable time travel theory. Okabe's message to himself to follow Suzua meant that she would never travel back to 1975, since the rain that day would break the time machine. What's more, after fixing her time machine and sending her back, something goes wrong and she doesn't remember anything or what she's supposed to do, meaning they never get an IBM 5100 and Suzu kills herself out of dishonor. This this proves that Okabe's only hope is to revert all the d-mails to return to the beta line, but he can't help but feel somewhat bad about doing so. Each revision would mean that the events that transpired before the previous world line wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have gotten as close to Suzu. Akia would have to lose her father again. Luka would have to go back to being a guy. And Moeka would not get what she wanted, though we do care less about her. She did kill Mayuri. Regardless of his feelings, it's the only way to prevent his friend from dying. So no matter how shitty he feels, it must be done. He starts with the fifth telling himself to not follow Suzu that night, meaning she goes back in time, gets an IBN, and gives it to Akia's dad. Without him dying though, Akia would never have donated the IBN to the shrine, so he reverts that too. When Nuka is a girl, she ends up breaking the computer as it's too heavy, so he reverts that too. During all these world line jumps, some unique ideas are brought into the mix. First, Mayuri's death is delayed a day for each cancellation of a D-mail. Second, each time Okabe mentions the world line before the D-mail changes took effect, a person of interest remembers the alternate timeline, almost as if deep down they knew it was real. They felt it like a dream, but yet they realized that at some point it was a reality. This carries into the world line of Moeka's D-mail, where Okabe hears from Ayuri she's had dreams of dying painfully, making Okabe realize that even if he is altering and seemingly reverting time, the events still transpire and hurt in a different way. For Moeka, this reality is more than painful. In this alpha world line, Moeka steals the IBN from the shrine and hands it over to her superior, FB. FB stops contacting her though once she's completed her mission, and being that the only purpose she had in life was FB's need for her, when FB stops texting, Moeka commits suicide. Okabe being too late, reverts time and breaks into her apartment, taking the phone away from her. After sending a message he thought would revert time, that being an Uno reverse about not buying a new phone, nothing happens. Her real message was the location of the IBN. When sending an Uno reverse for this one though, the same problem arises. 
the world lines don't shift. Okabe deduces that the only way he can get Moeka to not check the shrine is to send the message from someone she wholly trusts that being FB. During all of this, Moeka is in a frenzy trying to get her phone back. Okabe eventually gives it back to her and berates her for her actions, or future actions that is. She admits that if FB told her to kill Mayuri, she would, and that she is purposeless without FB. But Okabe makes clear to her that she's serving a master that doesn't give a shit about her, and at this rate, she will kill herself four days from now. Hearing this freaks her out. She ends up telling him the location of the drop-off point of the stolen IBN so that he can track it to FB. He at first just wants to take the IBN and delete this certain data on Dmail, but realizes that that won't necessarily alter the world line enough to return to the beta line. He should take steps backwards, being mindful not to skip any alterations he's made. He along with Moeka track the package back to Okabe's landlord that owns the CRT shop underneath his lab, Yugo. Yugo when confronted admits that he is FB, leader of the rounders. He asks the two along with Kurisu to take this outside as his daughter is sleeping. Here Yugo explains he joined the mercenary group after living in a war-torn country, but after having a wife and daughter, he wanted to leave. However, if you do that, they'll only hunt you down and murder your family, so he was forced to continue against his will. We also find out that the Rounders are working for CERN, and CERN is being puppeteered by the Committee of 300, a secret society likely based off the Illuminati that runs the world from the shadows. It seems Okabe isn't as crazy and superstitious as we originally thought. Yugo tells them he is merely a puppet for those truly in power, and to protect his daughter, he kills Moeka for selling the org out, as well as himself, so that CERN, Committee of 300, and Rounder will not come after her. Okabe grabs Yugo's phone from his corpse and sends the message, transporting him back to a world line, with the IBN still at the shrine, and one with Yugo and Moeka still alive. Somehow, he's done it. He's successfully returned to a world line with access to an IBN, where he can erase CERN's data on D-mail, but there's one tiny issue. If he erases that D-mail, if he returns to the beta world line, what will happen to Krisu? He'd be returning to a world line that, like Mayuri's fate in beta, would seal certain death for Krisu. There has to be a way to prevent that. A way to save both of them. A method to escape this torment. The suffering that comes from his choice is too great. In the palm of his hand, he holds the life of Krisu, as well as Mayuri. He's forced to choose a world line where one dies and one lives. He's stuck in limbo, refusing to delete the final D-mail, waiting till Mayuri's death, then traveling back just to sit on it again. After a few times of this cycle, Kurisu notices Okabe being less odd and more ponderous than usual. She gets him to confess what would happen if he was to delete the D-mail and return to the beta line. While the initial shock of her inevitable death lingers in the air, Kurisu points out that the way things are, Okabe will just be stuck in an endless cycle of suffering, continuously watching as Mayuri dies in front of him. She does not understand why he won't just sacrifice her to save Mayuri. Mayuri must mean more to him than she's worth. It's bickering about it, leading Okabe to finally tell her he loves her, and he can't imagine living in a world without her as much as without Mayuri. Kurisu reciprocates the feelings, but tells him he must bear one more burden for both their sakes, pushing him to delete the D-mail from the certain system. After all, just because Kurisu is dead in the beta world line doesn't mean she's dead in all the timelines. Time is relative. While she may have died in his perception of the universe, she lives on in another, a final thought to make the reality Okabe must face a little easier to bear as he deletes the date. From the days it becomes clear, Daru and Mayuri no longer know Krisu, her time in the lab as their friend a lost memory except for the one with the reading Steiner. Okabe alone must bear the burden of memory, the good and the bad. He bellows to the sky in egotistical fanfare, but the Mayuri in his head turns to him, telling him it's okay to cry now. It's okay to drop the emotional wall. She's safe, even if someone was sacrificed in this pursuit, or so we think. Okabe got rid of the phone microwave and his aspirations of conquering time, but even so a time machine remains, one he did not see coming. Suzu comes from the future to her father and uncle, explaining that Okabe can prevent Kurisu's death without returning to World Line Alpha. There is a way for both the girls to live, return to the past, prevent the murder of Kurisu and all will be fine, he's told. Going back, he lays in wait to stop the attacker, 
from killing his assistant. He spots her talking to her father, a man she mentions hates her every being because she was smarter than he could ever hope to become. Her ideas trumping his own, and his own ego leading him to try and kill his daughter and steal her research. Okabe jumps out and tries to stop him, running at him with a knife before he can stab his own daughter. The man leaps out of the way, Okabe's knife sinking itself into Kirisu. The one who murdered the woman he loves was himself, and if not him, her father. He realizes in this moment that it's the same as on Alpha. It's inevitable that she dies. It's a key event to propel the world line beta into the future, and he can't prevent it. Suzu takes him back to 2010, to the rooftop where he sinks in defeat. Maybe there never was anything that he could do. Okabe's despair is met with an equally terrifying realization that Kurisu's father sold her research he claims as his own to the Russian government. This research a perfect theory that will lead to the development of time machines, sparking an arms race to conquer all of time. This arms race would eventually lead to World War III, as all the major powers try to seize control of time. The man behind the slaughter was just lucky enough that a metal toy was in the folder that prevented the documents from burning on a cargo plane. That toy is the same one Mayuri got the day Kurisu died. It seems World Line Beta is destined for a major world war, but Suzu tells Okabe to check his phone. On it, there is a solution. Early on, Okabe was sent a static message that seems like nothing important, but the key to revealing the video behind the static was Okabe failing to save Kurisu. His failure was a necessary step in the plan known as Operation Schooled. For future Okabe to even have motivation to create the plan, he had to have experienced killing Kurisu, leading him to continue time research Research, become the leader of the resistance against the World Order, the Committee of 300, and ultimately share this message with his past self. A message explaining that there is a world line where both girls live, a world line that avoids the world war, a world line that lives in harmony and that world line has been deemed Stein's Gate. To access this world line, Okabe must not think of changing the past. He must think of duping it. It's vital for the Okabe that first saw Kurisu die to see her in a puddle of blood. This sends him into the entire events of the show, leading to eventually Okabe sending this message to himself, who then continues the cycle. It's also vital that this time travel research that Kurisu wrote gets burned on the cargo plane to prevent World War III. If he was to maintain this and alter that, then it'll be enough of a review vision to cross the 1% line that separates the world lines, enough to enter Stein's Gate, a fictional name that Okabe liked and gave his perfect scenario world line. So Okabe gets to work. As long as his past self thinks he saw Kurisu die, the continuity remains, and Stein's Gate is possible, and if he prevents Mayuri from getting and losing the metal toy, instead losing a plastic, then the documents will be cleared for the plane and burn on it, preventing the time machine arms race. So he does exactly that, buying the metal toy meaning that the next would be plastic, and fighting off Kurisu's father who runs away with the documents. He knocks her out, and with his fresh wound, from being stabbed by her father coats the ground in his own blood. This allows everything to happen as it should, minus the documents getting to Russia and Kurisu actually dying. And so, the world line enters Stein's gate. Suzu wishes Okabe goodbye as she fades away, her future time traveling self not existing in this timeline, meaning she won't see her uncle again until she's born in seven years. Okabe continues into the bliss alone, the world fading away around him as he enters Stein's gate. Arriving into the new world line, Okabe is happy just knowing the woman he loves remains alive, despite her holding no memories of their relationship, and so too is his childhood friend alive. The document burned in the crash, and everyone believes that Kurisu's father is a quack with all his time machine nonsense. Okabe gives all the ones who are, or will, or had become lab members badges, each signifying the order they join. As he walks down Akiba's streets, he wonders what Kurisu might be up to. She may be nose deep in some research, teaching a lecture in America, maybe reading a good book. But to his surprise, she runs directly into him, having searched for him all this time to say thank you. He had stopped her father from killing her, and Okabe smugly takes the praise. <laughs> Oddly enough, Kurisu responds, <laughs> something that she should know nothing of, that phrase only used in a different world line. But it seems that, like earlier stated, within everyone are memories, feelings of their other selves from timelines, their past, present, or future your lives. Okabe hearing this line realizes it was inevitable the two of them would be brought together. He stops mourning the lost time they had and relationship they built, because he knows that what's important is right here in front of him. He can build something anew with her. It seems it was the choice of fate to unite these two souls. It seems that this was the choice of Stein's Gate. 
While the narrative may be finished, there is still a hole in the plot left unexplored. The worldline beta that would find itself in the brink of catastrophic war that Okabe found himself in before launching Operation Scold following his failures to save Kurisu. What exactly happened? To this Okabe? That answer can only be found within the successor to the first. The sacrifices it took to achieve the world line known as Stein's Gate remain shrewd in mystery only to be revealed in the number that comes before one.